everyone okay so now we're going to be looking at the residual layer normalization layer this actually involves two things one is something known as a residual connection and the other is something known as layer normalization we'll start with layer normalization okay so where have we heard of normalization before well when we're feeding data into a machine learning algorithm especially in the case of computer vision for example or numerical data we know that we should normalize the data before we feed it into the model such that it has a uh, zero mean. Um, and we can do this in one of two ways. One is uh, normalization, i.e. taking the min and the max and dividing them together. Or the other is standardization, which is given by uh, this formula here. I'll just turn the laser pointer on. So uh, the standardized version of x is x minus the mean of the data divided by the standard deviation of the data. Now. There are also normalization techniques which work internal to a neural network. Batch normalization is, is the common one. Um, but there's also group normalization and what we'll be looking at today, layer normalization. Now, I'm not going to dive too deep into layer normalization. It's kind of out of scope. Um, I will describe the intuition and everything's done on this slide. So what layer normalization does at a high level is it normalizes the features of one sample in one batch. So if we have a batch, let me let me draw this out real quick. Uh, if we have a batch of um, uh, k elements, so batch equals x1, comma, x2, comma, 1, 2, 3, xk. And uh, let's say we've fed this batch through some kind of layer in the in the neural network. So we have representations for, uh, we have hidden representations of x1, x2, uh, all the way up to xk. And these will be in d-dimensional space. So one arbitrary x, uh, one arbitrary process x, which I'll just uh, denote here as x tilde, um, and this will just be an arbitrary x, will be in uh, some d-dimensional space. Now, layer normalization will normalize one sample. Um, one sample in the batch, and it normalizes the features in this d-dimensional vector. So let's say this would this d-dimensional vector is uh, apologies uh, 0 0.0, 0 0.1, 0 0.2, and so forth. However many uh, we actually have, we're going to normalize um, the, the, the 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 these feature values here. Okay, now. Um, we do this by, first of all, taking the mean and the variance, similar to how we perform this standardization here. Uh, however, once we've obtained that, what we do is, um, so we'll, we'll perform this typical uh, standardization operation over, over this vector. And then what we'll do is this will give us x hat i. We have two learnable parameters, uh, a lambda and a beta. And these will these will learn these using some kind of neural network. And we will apply this to the normalized version of, of x tilde here. Or I guess this is uh, this is x hat, so uh, maybe maybe this this is better. So x hat and i. Okay, and that's layer normalization. PyTorch gives us a way that we can actually do this using um, uh, using a layer in PyTorch. So we'll we'll look at that as opposed to implementing it from scratch. But I will link you to some resources so you can check out the description if you do want to code it up yourself. It is very simple, just two neural networks, one to learn um, one to learn lambda, the other to learn beta, and then we just perform the standardization operation. Okay, next up is residual collections. So uh, before we get into this, just think about the theory of neural networks when you first learnt it. Basically Deeper layers equals more power. There should be uh, some some kind of meme here, but that's the, that's the kind of theory, right? Like if we just stack layers on top of each other, or if we make them uh, really deep, then we should get a lower training error. But the practicality of it is not really following suit, and uh, residual connections are hold my activations. So here on uh, on this little graph, I can visually demonstrate what I mean by that. So um, on the x-axis, we have the number of layers and the y-axis, we have the training error. So obviously, the lower the training error, the better. And this um, this light blue line is meant to be the, the theoretical, um, sorry, I, I should have I put a key, I should have put a key here. But the light blue line is meant to be the theoretical uh, or the theory behind um, behind the, the deeper neural networks, whereas the actual practicality is this uh, this dark blue line, where 
there comes a point where we get diminishing returns on the number of layers that we have. Not even diminishing returns, we get adversarial returns. So after a certain amount of layers, we might start seeing our training um, our training error increase. And obviously, we, we, we probably are suffering from overfitting and a couple of other issues at this point. Residual connections allow us to match this theory. And let me just check what... Um, now, the way they do this is, um, we can go to this net next network, is uh, imagine a plane network with, which has six layers, right? This A stands for activation. So we have some input X, and we feed it into um, our first layer, and then we activate the value, feed it into our next layer, we activate the value, so forth, right? All the way up until uh, we reach the end of the network and get Y. What a residual network does is it learns the difference from the previous layers. And uh, again, I won't dive too much into the maths, but Andrew Wang has a great little video on how residual connections work. If you are interested in the theory behind it, then check it out. Um, we're just going to, uh, uh, how do I word this? Take the assumption of this is how it works and it does work. And then we're just going to run run with that and implement it because it's kind of separate from the transformers. It's, it's, um, it, it's, it's, it, it has its origins in, in computer vision. So we, we have X, we'll feed it into layer one, we'll activate layer one, we'll feed the output into layer two. Now what we're gonna do is we're gonna take X and we're gonna feed that into layer two before the activation of layer two. So we'll have the output of layer one plus X and this will be our input to layer two. We'll activate this value, this will give us some kind of output. This output will be fed through layer three, we'll activate layer three, we'll go to feed layer three into layer four, but we'll also, before we feed it into layer four, we'll add the two together, and then together we'll feed this into layer four, and then we'll activate it, rinse and repeat, so forth. So basically every other layer has some kind of, um, uh, has information about the, uh, the pre uh, not the preceding layer, but the layer before that. So here uh, we have the information from layer three flowing in. And we also have the difference of the information from layer two being fed into layer four. Um, okay, so let's code this up. Okay, so we have our residual layer norm. And here we'll be actually in the layers. So we'll look at residual layer norm. Uh, let's just drag it over here. Okay, so this is all the, the layer actually consists of. One is, uh, if we look at the constructor, we feed in the, the model dimensionality and we actually have a PyTorch layer which does layer normalization for us. So the only parameter this requires is um, is the, the shape of, of the dimension of our model. So here that's just D model. And we also have a dropout layer. Um, there's a dropout in basically every layer in the, in the transformer. Now, in the forward pass, what we're going to do is we're going to feed in X and we're also going to feed in our residual. So if we take a look at our presentation again, so let's say we're on layer three, we're going to, or layer four, we're going to feed in X, which will be the output of layer three, and what we want to apply a residual to, which will be the output of layer two. And then we just add the two together. That's literally all we do. We just add X and the residual connection, um, or, or uh, the residual tensor. We'll feed that through the layer normalization, and then we'll return it with dropout applied to it. Now let's take a look at that in the, in the examples. Okay, so we're going to initialize a, um, a toy random X. So this will just be some, uh, this, this is what we'll use as our residual, uh, residual tensor. We'll initialize our layer normalization class. Um, so we're just gonna have our model dimensionality as four, just to work with these toy examples. And then we'll call our normalization layer. So what we call it with is the toy encodings. So this is what we obtained in the multi-head attention set where we, uh, I probably have it here in the history. Um, so this is our tensor, a shape batch size is one, one, uh, our sequence length is three, so that's one, two, three, and our model dimensionality is four. So um, what we're going to do internally, what happens is this toy norm layer is called, it will, uh, whoops, it will add our X, so our toy encodings, and also the residual connections or the residual tensor 
um, which is just here initialized randomly. And we will then uh, take this output, the layer normalization, the layer normalized output, print it and print it shape as well. And there we go. Uh, obviously, it's kind of meant to be uninterpretable. It's it's all in 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 uh, what do you call it vectors, not vectors, uh, hidden hidden states. So we're not training this network, um, whatever else. But this this layer normalization helps stabilize the and, and normalize the outputs of um, our multi head self attention mechanism and basically every every mechanism that we actually run in the uh, in the transformer stack. Cool. Uh, I might as well tackle position-wise feed-forward networks here as well. So where we are so far is um, we've, we've seen that if we have the output of the previous encoder, we're going to feed this into a multi-head self-attention mechanism. We'll have the output of this multi-head self-attention mechanism fe being fed into a residual and layer normalized connection. So the residual tensor here will be this. Um, so, so for this particular layer here, the residual connection will be the input tensor X or the input tensor, um, as in the, the input to this encoder layer, and also the output of the multi-head self-attention. So basically, if we were to assign this to X and residual, as we saw in the code, X would be um, the output of this multi-head self-attention block and residual would be the uh, this, this input to the encoder layer. So um, if I just draw this on here, just to clarify that real quickly. So this will get fed into this multi-head, that was terrible. Um, this will get fed into there, this will get fed into there, and then this will also get fed into this. So this tensor and this tensor get added together, they get passed through the layer normalization, and this will be sent to the position-wise feedforward network. Now, the position-wise feedforward network is actually just a simple feedforward network. The position-wise just means that it the same set of weights are applied to every element in the sequence. Okay, so um, we will learn. I mean, it, uh, I mean, technically, it's like a you're applying just a one D convolution over the sequence. Don't worry if you don't understand that. All, all we're all we're saying here is like. For every single element in our sequence, so we have t elements in in uh, in our tensor or in in one batch, we're going to apply the same transformation to every element in this in this tensor. Okay, and the way that this is given is um, in maths in the paper. This is given as max of zero x w one plus b times w two plus b two. So uh, just to provide you with some some brief intuition about how you should be thinking about something like this is okay when we see w plus b and sorry there should be a b1 here um, we should consider this as a linear transformation so in torch we would literally write nn dot linear now we will call forward of this with x and we're in this max function okay um, max between zero and x well that's a relu activation function so what this is saying here is we have a two layered network we have w1 and w2 so there's two layers here and there's a relu activation on uh, on the output of w1 okay so uh, with regards to model dimensionality um w1 is going to be d by dff so ff stands for feed forward and w2 is going to be dff by d where dff is 2048 and this is the the number in the paper so uh, just for just so we can have numbers on on everything here, um, if I just go back to the pen, it should be an easy way of doing that to be honest. Um, so let's say d equals uh, two five. Well, let's say it's five twelve. I think that's what they put in the paper. Okay. So typically DFF is four times uh, d. This should be uh, following our notation here. This should be capital D. Okay. So. What we're saying is with W1, we have a tensor. So our X here is going to be T times D. And then we're going to transform that into DFF. So the uh, I, I have to write over what I have here. So let me, let me see if I can do that clearly. So what's being fed into this ReLU is max of zero by something which is in um, T by DFF, okay? 
and then whatever the output of this this ReLU is going to be, we get this. So this this is going to also be in because the the ReLU isn't changing any shapes. It's just going to be in T by D F F, and then we feed this tensor into W two. So W two is D F F by D, which means that this D F F will get uh, so. Then we apply W2 to this, W2, and this will give us something which, uh, sorry, that, that's not quite right. And then once we map model it with W2, we'll get something in T by D, okay? So all we've done is we've projected our input X up to a larger dimensionality. So we've projected it from 512 to 2048. We've applied some activation to it, and then we've projected it back down to 512. That's it. Let's uh, let's take a look at how to code this up. Um, so we've got a class called uh, PWFFN, Position Wise Feed Forward Network, in layers, and we're just using a torch sequential. So our constructor is taking D model and DFF. Um, and in the sequential, we'll just apply a linear layer. So this will go from D to DFF. And then we have a ReLU activation function with a little dropout in the middle. And then we'll go back from DFF to D model. And our, our input X, which is going to be batch times T or sequence length here times D, we'll feed that through the feed forward network that we've just initialized here. And this will give us the output, which we return back. So if we just uh, actually use this code, so um, I've changed the model dimensionality, but I've just kept DFF four times of whatever D model is. Um, so we'll just initialize this in this line, and then we'll run the layer uh, on the output of the, the, the normalization, and we'll print that and the shapes. Okay, so we've just, we've taken this norm, we've taken this here, and we've just run a, a neural network on top of this. We've applied the same set of weights to every, this element, this element, and this element. And uh, yeah, that's it for position-wise feed-forward networks. In the next lesson, we'll be looking at uh, positional encoding and the embedding layer inside of the encoder. Cool. I will see you guys tomorrow. Bye.